forever. Dog. When first choice is a big old bus, you turn around and boom, you end up with us. Our number is 213-536-9180. Oh, I forgot it's a song now. Our number is 213-536-9180. Our email is sloppysecondspot at gmail.com. Now, on with the show. Are you ready for some sloppy seconds? You stupid little fuck, you nasty little fuck, you dirty little fuck, you stupid little fucks. It's getting cold. You got to stay inside still. I'm Big Dipper, and that's Meatball. Welcome back no. to Sloppy Seconds with Big Dipper. I'm Rachel, and that's Meatball. Welcome back to Sloppy Seconds with Big Dipper and Meatball. I'm Rachel, that's Monica, and where is Phoebe? Her uh, last name on the show is the word buffet, but pronounced buffet. funny. Yeah. But it's not like she... You know how, like, in classical characters, people are named for the job that they did? Yes. Like, but she didn't eat a lot. No. You know, I <laughs> am too young for friends, so okay. I only All know, right. like, the classic episodes. I know Pivot. I know oh, yeah, Turkey on the Head. I know, like, being locked out of the apartment trying to get in, I guess. Joey was trying to get in one time. I don't know. Do you know and I know I Joey had a spinoff show where he went to Miami, and that only lasted one season. But isn't, I've never seen this, so drag me in the comments, but um, I've heard the show Episodes, which is apparently very, very good, a lot of yes. people like it, is about the actor Matt LeBlanc sort of post-Friends, I think. I don't know. I've heard that's great. Something to think, something to think something about to and think explore maybe while you're staying this inside. Because we're not going to watch it, and then you yeah. can tell us about it when you call us at two one three five three six nine one eight zero. What I do think is wild is that, uh, again, fact check me. But Friends, you know, I think it was revealed that like Friends on the streaming service, like Friends on Netflix, was still making more money than new TV shows. Like it has that much of a cultural hold. It's Which is so crazy. so crazy. People no. love it. And I just never, it's like the same with Seinfeld. I think that they're funny. There's really great episodes, but I've never sure. been inclined to like watch those characters interacting for more than 30 minutes at a time. Like I, I will tell I you, binge it. I've been going back and watching, you know, a lot of new shows have appeared on Netflix. Like we talked about how I was watching Girlfriends and like, um, Mm -hmm. sort of four seasons in i was like i'm i'm good like they're doing the same thing over and over again and i feel like friends did that but there was something about it that made it like a little i don't know i don't know kept kept the audience guessing wait i'm curious about these pumpkins we carved last week oh they already rotted so they rotted <laughs> they rotted i put they them out rotted or they got eaten they got half eaten by a squirrel because there was, like, some insides and there's teeth marks. But, like, the pumpkin that we left on the back porch that wasn't carved had, like, a squirrel had eaten into it. Oh. So and we on the front porch, I think it ate the inside and then it it, it molded up and, and they rotted and they collapsed. So the pumpkin had gotten eaten out? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's take a little break and then we'll be back with our guests, which is so exciting. Yes! Time to sell things. Okay, okay, we are hitting the home stretch of 2020, and Baby. guess what, Diva? I'm spiraling. Yep! It's elections, and it's holidays, then the world is on fire, and then there's still a pandemic happening. I was supposed to go to New Orleans for New Year's. I ain't going there. Ugh. I mean, I guess we should all be using BetterHelp then, try to talk through all these problems. You know, BetterHelp connects you with professional counseling done securely over the internet. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. That's right. It's professional counseling done securely online, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. That's incredible. Plus, there are, is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. That's right. So you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor, and then you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions from home. That's right. So that way you'll never have to sit in an uncomfortable and poorly decorated waiting room that's also full of germs. 
Like with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Would you want to hear some fire reviews from BetterHelp users? I love when they're fire. Fire reviews. Okay, here's one. I have really enjoyed working with my therapist. She understood my therapy goals and really... Oh, I love the idea of therapy goals. Yeah, baby. Set a goal and live up to it. She understood my therapy goals and really brought in a research-based perspective into the feelings that I had and which I was confused about. I am now understanding myself better because of her insights. Go off. Okay. Well, to read more reviews for yourself, just visit BetterHelp.com slash reviews. And there's ones posted every day. So visit BetterHelp.com slash sloppy for our discount. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Our listeners get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash sloppy. That's better H-E-L-P.com slash sloppy for 10% off your first month. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Boop. Okay, we are back. And we're back! And listen, I'm very excited for today because I feel like we have like a legitimate person on the show, Mm -hmm. which is sort of Our first real guest. (laughs) We're normally just like texting our friends, but we had like, we had like a a manager person sort of like inquire about this legitimate person being on the show. And I was like, is it, they mean our show? Yeah, I was very confused. I was like, are they sure they don't mean someone else's show where people (laughs) (laughs) listen to smart people talk? Yes. All right. So please welcome a New York Times top 10 best selling writer, actor, Whoa. director, Whoa. journalist, Whoa. podcast host, LGBTQ activist, and Miss Mama, Miss Ma'am. It's Gabby Dunn. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. I, I like this show. I'm a fan of this show. And also, yes. like, oh I listen. Gosh. I listened to Race Chaser with you. I've watched Dragula. Uh, I, I, oh. you're like, you're a real person. I'm like, no, I just, I like you guys. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you so, so crazy, much. Because when I yeah. looked you up, I saw the your picture and I was like, okay, I know this person. Yeah, Why do too. I know this person? And it was like, I went and looked and I realized it was, I think I watched a bunch of your, like you used to direct and write for BuzzFeed. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked at BuzzFeed for probably like eight months in 2014 or 2015, and that's still such a huge thing. <laughs> it's so Wait, weird. Why, what do why you is think? it such a huge thing? You made such an impact in that time? or Yeah, I think it was like a golden era of BuzzFeed where there were like, it was like a cast that everybody really liked. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think like it was just kind of like an, an OG cast that then I think they tried to keep replicating and it didn't really work and I don't I mean I was there with like Quinta and Mm -hmm, you know Ashley Perez and Eugene uh and the other Try Guys and like Mm -hmm. it was kind of a and and nobody really knew what they were doing and also the the problem of being there at that time is that nobody really knew what they were doing so (laughs) uh well isn't that always sort of the case where it's like when the thing really has the pop Mm-hmm. It's also like you ask people about it and they're like, well, it's kind of a clusterfuck and we didn't really know. And then yep. all of a sudden, like everyone was paying attention to us and then it sort of imploded and now we all do other things. Yeah. Well, that's 100% what happened. Yeah. That's what, ha- and like it blew up. And then nobody really knew what that meant. And so then there were like all these sort of crazy contracts that were like, they tried to lock all of us down really quickly. Oh. And they were like, and, and this contract says that you like can't even talk to a pro- like you can't even talk to anyone outside of the company and you can't even like like if we find out you're making videos for your own channel like you're fucked like it was like very oh, very intense I all of a sudden. It was, like holding you hostage yeah, is that why little... so many people made why I'm leaving BuzzFeed videos mm-hmm. <laughs> and they were all like mm-hmm. very like I just gonna go I'm gonna work on me now yeah did you ever make one we. Me and my comedy partner that I do my podcast with, we like did a little uh, on our friend John Green's channel. Like he asked us to make a video and then we were like, okay, we're going to make it on that channel. Uh, But like we, 
we like I, I don't know it was I I kind of blew it up like I yeah. wrote a bunch of articles and stuff being like fuck you as soon as my NDA was done <laughs> like the day my NDA ran out I was like yes, here's a bunch of articles about why this was fucked up here's three episodes of my own bad with money podcast about why this was fucked up here's like well I wrote this article called get rich or die vlogging that was like mm-hmm. that's like what kind of blew up which was about all the people that were working for uh, you for work were doing YouTube stuff, but primarily a lot of them were doing BuzzFeed stuff. And they also had to have day jobs because BuzzFeed like wouldn't hire them, wouldn't give them health insurance. Like right. wouldn't. Wow. one of the craziest stories was um, my friend, Brittany Ashley, who was like one of the most famous people on BuzzFeed yeah. at the time, but they wouldn't hire her as some sort of like weird power play, I guess like the guy in charge, Zay Frank was like a, a, just a I th- I think a bad person but mm. so he so he was like he, doing this power play of like getting her to come back for like $50 a, a shoot but then not hiring her even though she like really wanted to be hired and it was this weird uh. thing and she worked at this restaurant and then BuzzFeed threw their Golden Globes party at that restaurant uh. and she and she had to like serve at it like it was just like psychological torture I that he was like very into out. Yeah, he was like really into sight. One time he, he like, he, me and Allison had worked there and were like one of the top people. And I ran into him after we had left and he pretended to not know Allison's name. Psycho shit. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. This sounds like a uh, Nexium uh, sort of psychology. No. This sounds like the. <laughs> what, <laughs> what I wanted to say is I feel like. Um, Waiting until your NDA runs out just to put everyone on blast from years ago is Meatball's like uh, oh, mission that's statement. Like, in life. You. I love to. <laughs> the I minute love to. Five years is up. I gotta let everybody know what really I, happened. I know yeah. that Meatball has alarms on his calendar set. <laughs> yeah. For when multiple NDAs are up to just sort of drag people and it's lawyers not... on speed dial when they come for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not a great like I think people handled their exits from BuzzFeed with grace and I handled mine by like throwing a Molotov cocktail and just being like, (laughs) I burn the bridge. I burn it (laughs) like whatever. And like, like who can like these these are not people that are like Jonah Preddy bus unions like these are not good people. So like whatever. But it was. Yeah, I kind of left in like a and fuck you and fuck you and fuck you. Right, (laughs) right, right. Which is my instinct, which is not always the best instinct. <laughs> but well, don't you? Fe- I was about to say it's the same with me. But don't you feel better knowing that, like, at least no matter what, at least you stood up for yourself. Like, if the rest of the people were too afraid, you were like, at least I did what you were all afraid to do. Yes, but then I, uh, I think my career maybe has. I think if I had been in certain situations, I had been more gracious, but I can't resist. Listen, you could have been more gracious, but I think that you're the only one that was on Good Morning America. So that's true. What's, what's that's that true. Team, huh? <laughs> Wait, so I'm, and I want to get into this because, so this was a great launching off point because it is such a fascinating, you know, brave new world, even though we're, you know, over a decade into the idea mm-hmm. of like creators, like YouTube creators, podcast creators, Instagram influencers, like the whole thing. It's still very up in the air how people work on that and monetize that because mm-hmm. literally people will sit at home and make their own YouTube channel and work a 12 hour day, like being creative and not get paid for it. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, they've created this like internet clout because of followers, because they're tapping into an audience and then that can translate to money. But it is so wild that when, when, when large companies want to commodify that they go, Oh, we'll give you 50 bucks to make a video. Basically. Yeah. yeah. And because they have a platform. Right. And, but this is something we've talked about with, um, or I've been having, cause I just put out this music video, this idea that like, who's bigger is is the individual if they put it out on their own th- own platform to their followers does that actually reach more people or because it has a masthead over it even if it uh. reaches less people does it legitimize it somehow and i like i find that conversation so fascinating because literally one of them 
looks like, oh, I did a thing at home that sort of mm-hmm. went viral on the internet. And the other one looks like from the outside world, I have a legitimate job over here. But which one is actually putting more money in your pocket? Uh, Probably the independent person. Right. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, all the videos got millions of views. I remember, right. <laughs> I remember at BuzzFeed, they, they wouldn't, like, if your video got like a million views, they wouldn't give you a raise. They would just have this ceremony at the end of the week where they would give you like a pin. And then everyone oh. had pins like <laughs> based on like how many million do- million view videos they had. But like and everyone was so excited to get pins. And I was like, guys, they're underpaying us severely. <laughs> right. But part of it is here's the thing with these with these companies is that I was old to work there. So like mm. everyone there was like 21, 22, 23. Oh. And I when I started working there, I was 24. 526. Mm-hmm. So I a lot of these people it was their first job out of college and they were so scared of being fired and they really wanted to do a good job and they didn't know that like that wasn't enough money or whatever. They just wanted to get their foot in the door. Uh and I was coming from a place where like I had been fired multiple times. Like I was like this job <laughs> is not that important to me in the scheme of jobs. Like right. I like I like worked at an uh, in the IT desk at like a fitness magazine and I just straight up lied and then got health insurance and then uh, did all my doctor's (laughs) appointments. And then it took them three months to realize that I don't know anything about IT and to fire me like I don't (laughs) like I don't. I've been fired. Like it wasn't. But I think like (laughs) I think like a lot of these people. Like, yeah, I think I think a lot of these people like were young and they don't like confrontation and they also don't or not like confrontation, but like they're people pleasers and they're young and it's their first job out of college. And everyone is telling them, like, this is an amazing job. And like, yeah. Yeah, and like, oh, my God, I'm so jealous of you for having this job. And I'm right. kind of like. And it was like, it, you, like you were saying, it was the golden age, but from the outside looking in, BuzzFeed was like the coolest website yeah, for like for sure. five to 10 years. So if, if I would, if I was 21 and got a job there, I probably would have taken like punches just to work Exactly. There. That's yeah. what, and they count on that. They count on that. And but they were I treating you guys at- like Girl Scouts. Here's a little pin for a million views. I know. I but believe. if you get a million views on your own channel, that's for you. I mean, plus, yeah. I mean, YouTube is also like underpays people and puts right, Trump yeah, ads course. on your shit and demonetizes Literally. LGBTQ. Uh, any of our videos that they try to say that they don't, but like they do. I've, I've been in conversations with them where they've been like asked me to do pride things. And I'm like, I would love to do a pride thing. Unfortunately, you've demonetized every video with the word bisexual in the title that I've ever made. So that's going to be a no from me, dog. Like, I but then I like don't. And they literally put Trump ads on everyone. Every video. What is that? You're like, can I refuse an ad, please? Like, how can you ask me to to do things and then demonetize the stuff that is queer and then act like that's not what's happening. Right. It's so weird. I mean, I even, I don't know. I, I think I have a chip on my shoulder about places using queer people for like pride stuff and then, Mm -hmm. and then privately being shitty. Like, during it's Pride, not even a chip. It's like a really good foothold. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because dur- it's a horrible <laughs> thing that they do. Like during Pride, I'm sure you guys get this too. Like during Pride, we, they they want to do ads with us and stuff. And mm-hmm. then it took one company a full year to give me like the $4,000 that they were going to give me for running a Pride ad. And I was like, look, if this was a regular ad, this would be shitty. But the fact that you like used a marginalized identity to like, get money and then like didn't pay me for a full year and like made us yes. chase you down is like yes for a pride yeah. ad like really well it, i mean it, it, that's it's the so thing f- with drag queens they always complain about being used as props and then like they get to the shoot and they're getting dressed in a bat like ever, they just take full advantage of gay people just to say that they have gay people right. but like we all say? say we when you say drag queens you have to include yourself in that. I know you hate drag, but you have to say we. No, I always make sure to get paid. I'm not the one who's getting scammed. <laughs> Just kidding. We Wait, is this. So I wanna I wanna use all of this conversation to sort of transition us into um uh you being like a financial coach. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you started yeah. with the podcast called Bad with Money. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I, I, um, it was not my intention. I was, uh, I had come off of BuzzFeed and I had written that article that mm-hmm. had sort of blown up the idea that, I mean, I had been doing Postmates at the time. Like it sort of blew up this idea that cre- content creators were rich, like yeah. automatically. You know, I talked to friends of mine who tour- were YouTubers, worked at Starbucks, tour, you know, did tours at museums, whatever. Um, and people were like, oh, my God, you guys have day jobs. And they just didn't even understand. And I I had always had trouble with money, but I had always skated by like I would either like sell like some electronics or I would like get 50 bucks somehow or like whatever. I kind of never which like part of me is like if I hadn't been able to like pull shit together, maybe I would have figured things out in a more permanent manner mm. sooner. <laughs> um but I so like, yeah, and I and I had done internships where they, they were not paid. I mean, I worked at Viacom for oh. a whole summer. They didn't pay me, um, oh which now goodness. they think some I think someone sued and now they have to pay. But mm. yeah, I mean, I so so I I was frustrated. And so I made this podcast called Bad With Money because I was like, I'm not I don't even know like the. I listen to financial podcasts and it's like another language. Like I need someone to come on my show and I need, like I had like the woman from Elevest who's like this very like high up investment woman. And I was Mm -hmm. like, hi. So I guess my first question is what is a stock? Like (laughs) I'm not. (laughs) I agree completely. There was no, like I don't, I don't need anyone to come on my show and be like, da 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 da, like mutual funds, ETF, whatever. I'm like, oh, we don't, we what is, we need to know what a bank account is here first. Mm-hmm. Like, right. We need to understand interest. Like, so, so I was learning alongside everybody, and I would call. I mean, on the show, I would call my bank. I would call my student loan provider. I would, I would, like, I would say, like, hey, we're, I'm recording this. Is that okay? And they'd be like, uh, okay. And I would just like ask questions or be like, my mom was always like, you don't have to pay your student loans on time. And I'd be like, I don't think that's true. Yeah. And so I mean, like, you don't, you don't have, have to, to. Yeah. But she would there be is like, a consequence to it. So then I, I called, like, I asked her, I recorded her. And then I called the student loan people and was like, my mom says that we don't have to pay these on time. Is that true? And the woman was like, No, that's not true. Like, I would just like, so I was kind of figuring things out very publicly. Um, And, and it's still, and what's upsetting is that as I got further into it, it kind of, the show is like the radicalization of Gabby Dunn. Cause I kind of, as I further get into it, I'm like all of a sudden, like, like four, I'm like six seasons in and I've just gone like full leftist, like full socialist. Like, (laughs) yes, yes. Like the more you learn, the more you're like, holy shit. Like this is, this is insurmountable for some people. And like, if you start off behind the eight ball, like you're fucked. And like the way that the U S works with like medical debt or like, I just saw a Reddit post where they were like, Someone was like, if you're in the U.S. and you had COVID, like how much did you end up having to pay? And so many of the top comments were people in other countries being like, you have to pay for COVID treatment. I mean, and we're like, oh my God. yes, 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 we do. Yes, we have to pay for everything. Someone's yeah. like two day hospital visit I saw was like over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right. And so. so right. So everything is broken and everything's kind of broken <laughs> on purpose. And so. Right. I it's become now the show has become like very like way more about like the ways in which things are broken, but also sort of like ha- things you can do. But it's more broadly political. Uh, right. mm. And and then I and then the other thing that's crazy is that I to learn all of this stuff that like the average person does like you're a teacher and then you also take care of your household or you like, you know, our bus driver and you also take care of your household. I had to turn it into a full-time job just to be able to learn about all this stuff. So I had Mm. to like, I had to like make a podcast to one, motivate myself and two, (laughs) to, to even have the time. So like, how does the average person who's like working their job also be on top of all of this stuff? Well, I don't I think know. About, I think about this all the time. I, I talk to my parents about this. Like, obviously, my parents are, um, well, not obviously, but my parents are boomers, you know, and like mm-hmm. they, the world in which they were born into, like the generation above them, it was like build a life for 
our children. Mm -hmm. And then for them, it was like, we've built this life and it's up to you to um, like make it greater Mm -hmm. and bigger and like buy real estate and like put an inheritance together, like do all this stuff. Now, again, these are both people who, you know, we're dealing with white privilege here in the suburbs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then what I was told as a child was you can do whatever you want. Yep. Follow your dreams. Yeah. Oh, you want to be an artist? Go for it. Oh, you yeah. want to go to school for theater? Sure. You want to take that computer coding class? Oh, it doesn't look good to you? Fuck that. You don't yeah, need a yeah, skill. Yeah. You don't need a vocation. <laughs> and so yeah. so I do feel very lucky. I always say this when people talk to me about like being a performer or a creative producer. Like I feel lucky that the ideas that I come up with in my head, I have the skills and I was afforded the opportunity uh, and I have like the drive and the passion to turn those into things that then I can make money off of. Like, mm-hmm. I feel very lucky for that. But I, I sometimes go like, I wish someone had told me you want to be an artist. Great. But the first thing you need to do is get a damn job yeah. and yeah. start saving for your retirement and do all this stuff. It's like I'm in my mid 30s and I'm finally sort of turning mm-hmm. my gaze towards, oh, maybe I should think about when I'm 80 mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I don't have kids to take care of me. Mm-hmm. What if I'm going to get stuck in some room somewhere with no windows and die in a bed because you know our society doesn't take care of uh, old people we could only hope you ever now, think about that meatball i really think i've like no, really I thinking think about, about that, that i've been also thinking about how like although my parents were amazing and great and like set me up for such a great life they also i think kind of like handicapped me in that they never taught me about money they never taught me about interest there was no course on like writing a check or balancing a check like doing I think a all lot of that, of that is on purpose because it's taboo to talk about money it's a downer and then in school i mean we don't have we don't have a financial literacy class yeah we don't right. have, I love that we don't have the anybody telling us like it really is up to your guardians like you right. don't we don't have anybody telling us uh, get a bank account we don't have anybody telling us where to and also i think like it feels it's very much like it feels like uh, like you missed a day in school. So it feels yeah. weird to ask other people because everyone is pretending that they know. So you'll be yes. like, yeah. yeah, so it feels weird. It feels weird to be like, hey, like, is this a, a, like one thing that happened was I was working at BuzzFeed and I had my bank account open and I was, the guy next to me who was my boyfriend for a little bit, he was like rich, oh. came from wealthy family. Allison, who's my who sat behind me, who's like my right. friend who I work with. She comes from a very wealthy family. And so I'm like on my computer and I'm looking at my bank account and oh, no, my the guy was looking at his bank account and I saw a number and I went, oh, I have that, too. And he was like, what? And I was like, that's your credit card. Right. And it was like, I don't know, twenty three thousand dollars. And he was like, um, no, that's my checking account. And I was like. And then Allison was like, do you have $23,000 in debt? And I was like, no. And I guess like, I misunderstood. I didn't. And then both of them were like, wait, what? Yeah, they were both like, wait, what? And I was like, you what? Leave me alone. And that like, uh, that was how they like, and that but was there how. there are probably so many. I mean, they're not I probably. There are anything. so never. many people yeah. who have $23,000 in credit card debt. Never would have said anything. And that yeah. and their reaction, too, was what made me go, oh, this is not right. That um, is so wild. That's but so also, crazy. I was, they, again, both came from wealthy families. And it's right. also been really enlightening working with Allison in some ways because we get paid the same amount. So like, let's say we each get like 25K for something we've written. Like we wrote a, you know, a book or whatever. Yeah. She's plus 25K and I'm maybe plus 5K because I paid off a student loan. You know what I mean? Like, right. we, so yeah. I can very clearly see someone who's had the, the same payments as me that I, it's not the same. You know, and I got to tell you, the two things that you've said out loud, blah, 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 $4,000, blah, 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 25000 Even you just saying a number, I immediately was like, oh, should we bleep that? Like that, that's like, I know. You, it's so wild how ingrained it is yeah. to mm-hmm. not want to talk about money. I like to talk on the podcast in specific numbers. Yeah. And I like to talk about, yeah, I like to talk in specifics because I think nobody does. And it's also hard because- it's embarrassing in some ways because when I first started making money, I did not know what to do with it. 
Mm-hmm. So like, you know, the first payment that we got for like our first show, which was like 50K, I did like we sold a TV show. I was like, I don't know what to do with this. I moved to a bigger apartment. Why did I do that? I didn't need to do that. I was mm. like, I felt this pressure then. I was like throwing parties. I felt like, okay, I have to like oh. act like someone who has money now, which is very nouveau riche. And right, um, of course. <laughs> and like, like I, I went like full, like, like just like what I, my Florida brain imagines is classy. And, um, (laughs) like, I'm like, well, like, cause I've joked, like, I'm like, I'm going to get, when I have so, when I have money, I'm going to get so much work done. I'm going to have French tip nails. I'm going to be like, this is like my like trailer Mm -hmm. park brain. And so like, but so I was doing, and then I blew through all that money. And then people were like, well, what uh, you had money? Like what happened? And I was like, I had no training. Like I went from $0 to like this amount of money where I was like, I don't know what you do with that. So it's just as bad. And sometimes even like there's this book by um, Rachel Sherman called uneasy street, which is talking about rich people and rich people have no clue where their money's going. There's like one part where this woman is like talking to her husband, like they're millionaires or something. And she's like, what did we spend $65,000 on this month? And he was like, I don't know. And she was like, I don't know either. Like they just wow. don't know. How do and you then, not know? I don't well, know that- because they're so rich they just don't know. And I would qualify that as bad with money. Meanwhile, like, you know, I think like the the single mother in East Texas or whatever uh knows where every dollar goes. Yeah. So is that right. person bad with money? Like, what does that mean? Oh, wow. That is so fascinating. Wait, so have you ever, just because I have to come from the queer angle here, yeah. Have you ever sat down with Susie Orman? We did. You uh-huh. did? Yes. Oh. Susie Orman is my guest on um, episode, uh, the fourth season, I think, first guest, the the premiere. Oh, oh yeah. We, oh, yeah. We okay, chatted. Good. Did you we, put on a jacket? I did, <laughs> did not. She did invite me to the private island she lives on. Okay. So what? She lives on a private island. Um with her partner, and they're very good at fishing, is, is the whole thing. And good with money. And good with money. Well, okay. So we had a real, we had a real time. She she reached out. Um, she's very intense. And uh, oh, yeah. she was like, I want, she's like, she she says your name a lot when she talks to you, which is, I think, I a like tactic. Yeah. Uh, and she she's very intense. We... We come from very, I mean, I was like interested in talking to her because we're both queer women. Like, I think in terms of queer women in financial media, it's me and her. Like, right. Uh And so I think, but we come at it from such different ways. And like one of the things that came up was I was like, you know, I, I don't think I would ever call the people that I am giving advice to stupid. Like, I don't think I would ever come at it from this way that Mm. I think a lot of these financial gurus do where they're just like, no, you do not buy that. You're a dummy. Da da da. And she uses the word dummy a lot. And she uses like, and so I was kind of like, you know, I don't think I would use that language to talk Mm -hmm. to people. And, um, and do you think that like, maybe it, it comes from like a place of, do you think that maybe you've lost touch? And she oh, was like, oh. she was like, you know, talked around him was like, no, like I right. come from, you know, I was a waitress and this and that. But like in my head, I always thought of it as like um, the bit in 30 Rock where Tracy can't do stand up anymore because he's too right. rich. So yeah. he's like, yeah, forget a bad lobster on Cape Cod. And people are like, what? And so like, I think that I is think, the I mean, vibe a little from a private island and you're like, do you think maybe you're a little out of touch? Yeah. I mean, I was I was glad to have her on the show and I think right. like it was interesting and she was like, she's like a like a mean mommy bully. Like she was like, I'll come on, like she emailed me first and then she was like, I'll come on your show if you, she wanted me to like write down, all, write down all the money that I have, like to like write down, like she wanted oh. me to like, she wanted compile- to like do her thing on yeah, you. Yeah, she wanted me to like compile some information for her. And then when I was like, hey, so we're scheduling whatever, she was like, wrote me back and was like, Gabby, did you get me the information? Like she was very like intense. And I was I like, I think I'm that. being bullied by Susie. <laughs> well, I always just, 
I don't think of her as her anymore. I just think of her as Kristen Wiig doing the I on know. SNL. I know. So, so I feel like I just would have like superimposed Kristen Wiig's face for the whole conversation. I'm looking at the emails that she sent me and it's like, they're unhinged, but it's so great. Um, I love she's that. like very, uh, yeah, she's just like she's just like very interested in me trying to like make the most money as possible and I wasn't as interested in that. And um yeah, the last yeah. email, the last email signs off with now I'm an older gay woman who's on a mission to master fishing. So up to you guys. Like saying like if I if I want to have uh, her on the show. Uh- <laughs> It's very, she's very, she, she seemed to, I mean, I, I appreciate it. Cause like how often do I think like the older gay community doesn't want anything to do with us. I think sometimes. Yeah. So I think she was just like, I remember being a young gay woman with like a lot of, you know, wonderment or whatever. And, you know, I think that the, she's very, what we came to was like, I'm very interested in the whys and the social justice aspect of it. And she's interested in, she's Capitalism. like, none of that matters. <laughs> Make mm-hmm. yourself like, do the best by yourself. Make the most money for yourself. Here's how you can do that. Don't worry about other people. Yeah. And I think that's, right. that's two different schools of thought that we have there. Yes. That's correct. That's two yeah. different generations of thought. So let's take a quick break and then we'll be back with more chats. More chats. More (laughs) chat. I have to blow my nose. Hey, hey, I'm Kelly. And I'm Lindsay. And we're from Teen Creeps. And I'm Alaska. I'm Willem. And we're from Race Chaser. (laughs) And we're here for some... Real talk, okay? Well, we want to sit down and have some real talk. So sit down. We want to talk to you about wireless plans. I hope your seat is comfortable for your little tush because breaking up with your old wireless provider just got a whole lot easier thanks to Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is introducing their unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month. Let that sink in. An unlimited plan for $30. How much is your soon-to-be ex wireless provider charging you? For people that hate their phone bill and are ready to cut ties with big wireless, Mint Mobile offers their premium unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional costs of retail, Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. So what does that mean for you? We'll tell you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. Break up with big wireless and switch to Mint Mobile's premium unlimited data plan for 30 bucks a month. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash sloppy. That's mintmobile.com slash sloppy. We're back. Have you seen Wicked? The musical? Yeah. Yes, I did. I cried though because I wanted to see it with Adina Menzel when I was 18 and she it was an understudy and so I cried the whole time. Oh, you probably saw Shoshana Bean. I know, but I was like a little, like a little gay w- child bitch, and so my parents. It was my, it was my graduation gift, and we flew to New York, and for me to see Adina Menzel, and then she wasn't in the, the show. Oh no! And then instead of being like, "It's okay, mom and dad, whatever," I fucking cried the whole time, the whole oh, show, like I, such I an asshole. You cried because it was so beautiful, but I understand. No, that. I cried because I. I wanted to see Adina Menzel, and then my parents were still like, that's a straight girl. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing weird about this. When did you come out to your parents, or did it just kind of happen? Um, They, well, I, 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 I thought I came out to them. Well, I, d- I was doing stand-up, <laughs> and I was talking about being bisexual in my stand-up, and they had seen the stand-up, and then I, like... And then my dad, I I was like with my dad at my older brother's 
place one time when I was in college and he was like, what's wrong with you? You're in a bad mood. And I was like, that's this girl or whatever. And he was like, what? And I was like, this girl, like this girl that I'm seeing. And he was like, what? And I was like, I fully came out to you two years ago. And he was like, wait, do it again. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. And so I like sat and was like, this is this. And he was, I was like, I talk about it in my standup. And he was like, I just thought it was like part of the, the act. And I was like, why would what? that be? Interesting. My Isn't that parents- crazy how yeah. par- people can just put blinders on and be like, oh, that's the art. That has nothing to do with what, yeah. what we're really about over well, here. my parents are. Like when I my- was a dancer. Like when you were a dancer <laughs> and your parents were like. And the audience and I was like up there and rhinestones killing it. And they're like, that's definitely a straight kid. Yeah, exactly. And he's going to like women. My <laughs> my parents were. My parents are lovely. They are um, nuts. Uh, and they're, my dad's a, was like an alcoholic and an addict for most of my life. Mm-hmm. He's sober, but I, there's like this, there's this beautiful narcissism where like, I, it's, it's this thing where I'm like, I'm lucky because I'm like, they didn't really care about the gay stuff. Like they really were just like, Ab- sure, absolutely, whatever. And mm-hmm. they've never like batted an eyelash at it. They're very supportive. They had like, my mom had like a rainbow background on her phone. And I was like, what is, and they live in Florida. And I was yeah. like visiting and I was like, what is that? And she was like, it's for you. And I was like, I don't live here. But like, <laughs> cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, big sign in their that. yard, like LGBTQ for Hillary during the election. I was like, OK, again, like, oh, I don't nice. live here. That's but, that's basic. My parents have like a little pride flag up and like my yeah. dad has it on the bookshelf when he teaches his college class over Zoom. So there's like I'm like, if they don't know you're married, you might have some young gay kids being like, oh, my professor gay is professor. gay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's for me. Yeah, I love yeah, that. I but mean, anyways, yeah. It's very, my mom is like, they're very leftist. So my mom is like, I was like, you know, she's on Facebook being like, this legislation affects my gay daughter. You know it. Right, right, right. Like she loves, uh, my partner right now is transmasculine. And I was like, you know that she is like at the synagogue being like my (laughs) trans son-in-law. Like she's like loving it. This is thrilling for her. Uh, So, but they are like, part of it is like, People are like, that's so lucky. But part of it is also that they don't care about anything that isn't uh, themselves. So like they like Mm -hmm. it doesn't like I would. It's lovely that they are like so supportive of the gay thing. But part of me is also like, but like it makes sense because they would have to care what I'm up to in some ways. Like they would have to if it doesn't directly affect them. It's like it doesn't matter yeah. in a way mm-hmm. i feel well, like they're using are it to then similar. create their experience right because their exactly. experience is we are yeah. the parents of right rather than like our daughter is yeah no that's yeah. a great way of putting it yeah, yeah. i mean they're very it, it is this i like when i came out i was sort of like do you guys have any questions and they were like no and I a little bit was like, you don't want to know like my journey or like my story or like, you know, you guys don't want to hear like how this has been for me. Right. And they were like, no. And I was like, okay. All right. Okay. Cause like it's insane. Yeah. Like it's kind of, it's been like a therapy journey in some ways of yeah. being like mm-hmm. the rewriting the narrative of like, this is lovely. And also I would love if they at any point in a conversation asked, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> we can go oh hours. I've tested it. We can go hours without any questions about how I am or what I'm doing. But oh. it's just like, I've, my parents, I feel like are very similar. Like I will talk to my mom on the phone for like an hour and a half and not once will it be like, and anyway, what are you up to? Nothing. Really? Not, yeah. Nothing. Uh, when I, ca- I told you that when I came out with makeup, I like told my mom and I sent her some and she like never talked about it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I it's- told you this. They do, my parents do not care what I'm up to. Or they, what I'm doing. Yeah, like, it's very strange. Like, they care, but it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Like, they're, they, they're Jews, so they, like, nitpick and stuff. But it's, like, <laughs> I, yeah, it's very, or they'll call me to be, like, do you know what your sister's doing? Like, your sister's doing this. Do you know what your sister's up to? And I'm, like, I, 
I You're don't like, care. Do you know what I'm up to? No, I. This is such a dark joke, but I've always, I've, I've always said like I could be standing on the Golden Gate Bridge, like about to kill myself, and my dad could call, and I could, I could, it could be two hours before he's like, "Where are you?" <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Wait, I have a question. Do you, do you have one of these? Do you, are you a checkbook yes. person or is oh, it all yeah. digital? Yeah, I have a checkbook. Uh huh. Okay. Why? What do you use checks for anymore? Um, what do I use checks for? <laughs> oh, like rent? I don't know. I over ordered. I think what happened My was is eighties. Yes. Ooh. Oh, I love that. I over ordered checks. Like when I opened my bank account, I have a thousand. Like, oh, I have a bajillion. You can you can order checks. I was like, great. And then I put them somewhere because I really only used it to pay rent. Mm-hmm. So I only needed one checkbook for like two years. Mm-hmm. So I put them somewhere and then I ran out of the one checkbook and I was like, oh, oh, and I ordered more. And then I found them. So now I have I have so many checks and I'm getting ready to move. And every new landlord is like, we do it all digitally. Just Venmo me your rent. And I was oh. like, what am I going to do with all these? Do you, you did you get them specially? Checks. Like, did you get a design or something? No. I mean, they're different colors. They're like a yeah. pastel. They like change colors, everyone. And they have my name and the address, you know, my current address I on became, them. But... I like fully became my mom because I was like, ooh, they have angel designs. Like, I yeah. like have, like, I mine is like, I wish I had one to show. It's like angels. You know, those like I, weird. And I, was I did like, that Let with me... my debit card. I was yeah. like, oh, this one has big semi trucks on it. I yep. like got a masculine <laughs> debit card for no apparent reason. Like, why do I need a debit card with three you semi trucks really on it? see it, but this is like angels playing the loot. It's not uh, why. <laughs> I got, I one time when I first got my credit card you could like put a picture on it Mm -hmm. but i sent the wrong file in so i just (gasps) got it back with like a picture of a file oh that's amazing (laughs) and so it was just this white credit card that was like error and i was like what am i this is is not what i want that is funny funny. that's very funny i would go find it but i don't want to i don't want to dig around so listen we're nearing the end but i I, (laughs) it, it seems like you host i don't know six podcasts uh you have like 12 books uh you do Three stand TV up shows. you put you sell tv yeah. shows you you're you, from you florida just, do you put out a graphic novel recent i mean it's like wh- what's the deal do you relax do you like just chill yeah. out you seem rich I, do you need a personal assistant <laughs> no i had it i had an assistant for the book which is great and oh, okay. i do i am very fine collaborating like i mm-hmm. the person who does the thing best let them do it I don't want yeah. I don't want to do it. Like with my graphic novel, people were like, Did you draw this? And I was like, girl, no. Like, there's somebody <laughs> who's good at drawing who did that. Like, I like I, I had a I, I had an audible original come out, which was about called Apocalypse Untreated, which was about mental health. And then I have bipolar disorder and I go through man- mania oh, wow. and depression. And so I when I was writing that, like midway through, I had like a very bad depressive episode and I brought on a friend of mine. I just like paid her and was like, you're my co-writer now. And like she did punch up and like her name's Brittany Nichols. And like I just like I'm very with the bad with money book. I was like freaking out. And then I was like, wait a minute, you can hire a research assistant. So like I brought mm. on a reason. This is another reason why I have no money, by the way, is because I'll like bring on an assistant or I'll I, I for the. For a lot of the stuff, I have sensitivity readers. So I'll have like, you know, like Asian American sensitivity reader, trans sensitivity reader for like all these characters that, you know, or like. And so because of that, and also let me tell you, publishing houses don't pay for that. Like the the company doesn't pay for that. Like it comes out of my own pocket. Like when we toured for the, when we toured for the book, I paid for ASL interpreters at every stop, but Mm. nobody else, no, no. You know what I mean? They're not going to cover that. So, uh, so I end up losing a lot of money for um, being a nice person. But I also like I al- so I also am good at collaborating with people. So I I delegate sometimes or like right, which I feel like people are afraid to do or they're afraid to say that they do or they're yeah. afraid to like. I had multiple friends helping me. I paid them, but like transcribing for 
you know, the the book and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that, I mean, that that's totally th- this thing that we all think, oh, uh, these amazing sort of like auteurs who do right. everything themselves. It's like, no, bitch, you can't make a movie with one person. Yeah. Yes, uh, it was often, that person's idea. They wrote it, they yeah. directed it, but there's a whole team of people, but the like the like the optics is like this person by themselves did of all course. the work. And and also the, you know, most of the directors that we lionize and love, their mm-hmm. editors are the ones who are really doing the heavy lifting. Go on. Um, that is very and true. And a lot of their editors are women. Um mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, I I, I am a workaholic. I definitely feel uh, like garbage if I don't have a new project and like I have a lot of like self-worth stuff, especially in the pandemic where I've been dealing with does anybody would anybody love me if I wasn't making them money, which is <laughs> Whoa. Um, even like, fr- you know, I think and like what's the answer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. I don't well, know. I don't know. I had like a very sad thing where like a, a editor that I had worked with many times on books, like um, she didn't, something went off, something was, went, I, I stirred a controversy on Twitter and then she was like, had to put pause on something. But instead of reaching out to me, like this is like someone I consider a friend. She didn't call me. Like she just talked to my manager and I was like, mm. what? Really? Yeah. And for some reason that's the part that is eating at me because it feeds into my idea that nobody cares about me unless I can make the money. And I was like, see, wow. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. But like Yeah, that that is so interesting, especially at a certain level when a lot of the professional communication is meant to go through the proper channels, even yeah. if you have like a friendship relationship, when people sort of default to the like, these are the standards and practices. So like right. I'm emailing your manager, you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. I thought we knew each other. Yeah, Pick up the phone, so give me the benefit of the doubt. Ask right. me how it, how it's going. You know what I mean? Like it was so bizarre. Uh, and yeah. so like that was bothering me. And like you know, I I with friends sometimes I'm like, do they are they? And they are my friends. They are. But in my mind, I'm like, are they my friends or are they waiting for me to give them a job? Like it's <laughs> like my own self worth, yeah. which like I don't know. I think as you get. I, and the pandemic is forcing me to reckon with that because I don't right. have I I don't have like certain things are on pause, you know, and like I don't have the like control that I once had. And so I'm mm-hmm. I scramble, but I'm very proactive. Like I scramble, like I'll be like, I don't have enough things. I don't have enough things. Who's this editor that I worked with one time five years ago? Maybe they want to give me a job. <laughs> like I'm very intense. So I don't, and then and then when I go through all of that, then like a month later, all the contracts come in, and I'm like, I've agreed to do 400 things. <laughs> I've made I've made a mistake. I've made a mistake. I that know is me that every feeling. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I will say is, you know, you, you you're talking about your your uh, self worth being linked to uh, uh, being able to get people jobs and money. My self worth is uh, linked to what. Fucking. Sex. So we have you landed at our fat, final sex segment. Whore. <laughs> which no, is I, called... that was, that is uh, also, uh, that is also a thing for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Then I think oh, we'll great. have a juicy, juicy conversation here in our segment, which we call Fuck Talk. Talk. That's so... from Wicked. <laughs> That's from now. The this film. is the time of the show where we, you know, if you feel like sharing an uncomfortable or strange sex story that's happened to you, um, or that you were a part of, or that you just saw from a distance in a park, <laughs> witness, yeah, God. you can easily tell that story now. For are instance, you as open about your sex life as you are about your financial life? I yes. am. Yeah, I yeah. was open about that stuff first, and everyone. That's part of why I started talking about money because everyone was like, "Wow, you're so brave. You talk about so many taboo so things." Brave. And I was like, "You don't even know." I was like, "I'll tell you all this shit." I was like, "You know what? I won't tell you that I went through my car for quarters yesterday." Like, I was like, "That's the real embarrassing thing." I'll be like, "Oh my god, you share so much." I was like, "Yeah, that like you don't even know. That's my re- my real secret was money, but you deflect That's by so saying crazy. other things that seem brave." Yeah. <laughs> Dipper, do you have any fun stories this week? Well, I, I, all that conversation about like coming out just made me think about, I don't know if I ever told this story, but this is like an old sort of like embarrassing college story. I came out when I was a senior in high school, but I never 
acted on it. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people sometimes like act on it like in a closet somewhere at a party, but then they're going, mm-hmm. but it was like, I knew I was gay and I came out and I was very much like, I am gay, but I like didn't do anything sexual for a long time. Sure. But I remember my first kiss was in a game of spin the bottle. So in it was in this high school in college, in college. which in is college. crazy. No, you've already told this story. Oh, I did. Wait, yes, you kissed a boy, no. but uh, I kissed the boy. The... It was, it was great. In Spin the Bottle, it was all boys, or you could have landed no, on a girl. No, it was mixed. It was, oh, it was. It, lucky so you. It was, it was, yeah, exactly. It was, it was. Everybody was playing. Yeah. And the first spin that I did, it landed on this really hot guy who I don't <gasps> think was gay, but we kissed and it was really hot, and I was like, oh, okay. And then Hard. you know, Hard uh, as a rock. Yeah, exactly. And then it landed. Um, and then it landed on a girl who we were all up on campus for the summer being orientation leaders. Mm-hmm. So we were like greeting all the new freshmen or whatever. So he was up there doing summer school. So I didn't really know him. So it was even hotter. But she was like one of my like co-workers. Oh, man. And I believe she was like a Christian who like wore a cross Ooh, on her neck. So baby. I French kissed him and it was really hot. But then with her, it was sort of like just like this little peck. And then I realized that I hadn't kissed a girl since like seventh grade when I had like <gasps> fake girlfriends. Right. So I was also like, whoa, that was wild too. Like it was this, it was a pretty like psycho thing. And now when I think about that, it's like, I don't even think about kissing anymore because kissing is always like dicks are out and dicks are going to right. bubble. You know, there's other yeah. things happening. But that was just such an isolated like kissing story. How what's romantic. The, what's the pandemic doing? My my partner is uh, on like the scruffs and grinders of the world. But like, uh-huh. it seems like a mess. It seems like people are just straight up lying yes. without being tested or like yes. they don't care or like what is going on? I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm not on the apps, but from what I understand, everyone is horny still. And yes. they're all faking like like they got tested yeah, two days ago. Yeah, they're faking negative and tests. Negative and stuff. And it's like, what are we supposed to start now like asking to see the results? Or like, you better add me, like email, email it to me when you get the results, honey. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so I, crazy. I shared this on the, the, uh, the podcast, but sort of like, Last month, I think I it was it last month or maybe the month before. I don't know. At this point, it's been too long. But uh, I reconnected with sort of like a regular fuck buddy that I had. Or I guess mm. more appropriately, suck buddy. And I was Dipper like, what have only you been up to? Right, 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 right. <laughs> I was like, what have you been up to? And he was like, blah, blah, blah. You know, nothing and no one. And so we basically reconnected and uh, sort of check in and ask about what the other person has been up to and when they got tested, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, like, I know where he lives. I know his address. You know, it's like I've known him for two years. Like, I feel pretty comfortable with him. But there are a lot of people out there. Like, I get messages all the time that are like, I've been taking loads all day. Come fill me up. I'm like ass in the air, ready to go. And I'm like, girl, you don't even know. Like there is a pandemic and guess what? The numbers are back up on the rise. Uh I don't think anything would keep, I don't think anything would keep people from the grinder situation. No, I I I think think it could be like literal zombies outside and they'd still be like, come over. Yeah. like, Does that zombie boner still work? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. Your story just reminded me of a time when I hooked up with like a theater camp counselor, but it was after camp. It was like, it was that thing where I was a senior, so I was 17. I was basically 18. I think I was 18 at that point. You love to I, tell your underage story. I'm trying to get these people arrested. No, um, <laughs> I, no I know that I was 18 because it was the summer and my birthday is in the summer. So I was 18 and I was about to like go off to college, but it was my last year to go to this theater camp. But it was like post-theater camp. Um, everyone went home to their different places in Texas. And then we all met up again in in Austin, Texas, like Mm -hmm. just the students. And they're like, oh, some of the counselors are in town. Like we should invite them to this house party. And so we're all drinking. And one of them, I remember I was like, I thought he was cute, but he was also straight. And he like cornered me in this laundry room (gasps) and put his arms on the wall. And he's like, how do you know you're gay? And I was like, I just, 
I just know I'm gay. Like, and he's like, would you tell your parents you're gay? And I'm like, I already did. And then he was like, but how would you, like, what makes you feel like you're gay? And I was like, I don't know. I just love being gay and men and I am not attracted to women. And he's like, so if I pulled my dick out right now, you would suck it? And I was like, I don't know. I'd have to look at it. And he pulled it out. And I, and then he, I was like, oh yeah, I'd suck it. And then he like took me to a, a closet in this stranger's house. And like, I started to suck it and he couldn't get hard. What is that? Uh, that is a him? journey. What is going on for that person psychologically? He needed to know. I think he wanted, and he is now gay and married to a man. He was asking the tough questions. He needed oh. to know because he needed to know. And then it turns yeah. out so that I was not his at, cup of soup. So you're bad at sucking dick? He could, you can get him hard? Bitch, no. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I was 18, so maybe I was. I think there was a lot mentally going on for that person. Yes, that, like, yeah, it sounds like take, it. I literally don't think take most, me to a closet. <laughs> I don't think the most sexual start is, how do you know you're gay? <laughs> <laughs> to trap me in a room and be like, how do you know you're gay? You and know? I was like, oh, honey. What's yeah, the quiz? Send me to the BuzzFeed quiz so I can yeah, figure exactly. out Yeah, exactly. Am I gay BuzzFeed quiz? Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. Ah! I had, um, you made me, you, I was trying to think of something I haven't talked about, but you, you reminded me of, (laughs) I, I was, I had dated this girl and she was like a lesbian, capital L. And we like, and then we were like on and off or whatever in college. And she was a, a literature major and she had a professor that was a guy that was like clearly in love with her, like was mm. just obviously in love with her. And he was like a hot professor, like on rate. My professors, everyone was like, he's so hot. And <laughs> my professors. yeah. And my my. And so he uh, she had like a party near the end of graduation. And he came to the party and was like clearly in love with her. And then like came up to talk to me and was like, you're so-and-so's ex-girlfriend, right? And I was like, yeah. Like, and he was like, oh, like just wanted to talk about her. And I was like, okay. And then I, for some reason, was like, do you want to get out of here? (laughs) Then he was like, like, yeah, okay. And so we left and then we hooked up at his very small studio apartment, which was all the walls were were covered in books. Like it was like that kind of like sad, hot professor guy who like was just like, all all the walls were covered in books, like messy desk, like just I've like, seen that episode of SVU. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, so then we hooked up. Then the next, then I like fell asleep. The next morning, he was like, "Hey," and he was like being weird. And then he was like, "Hey," so and I was like, "I I'm 18 and I'm about to graduate. You're fine." And he was like, "You're not gonna." Let, and I was like, "I will not be at school next year. I'm an adult." Like. I, oh I don't God. and I was like, you're panicking because you think that like I'm a current student. And he was like, Yeah. And I was like, I'm not. You lucked out. And then I left. Do what? you think Do you uh, okay, so th- That's insane. Yeah, there's this a is, lot happening there. Do you think that he was more inclined? Do, did he also have a crush on you? Or do you think oh, that you Oh, I had you not were... met him. I didn't know him. Oh, okay. My uh. my roommate. My roommate, who was my best friend at the time, was a literature major, and she had been in his class, and she always talked about how hot he was. God, and then always I knew the literature from, teachers. I knew from my ex girlfriend that he was like obsessed with her. Because part of me is like, if you were like, you know, I used to date so and so, so she's been on this body. That's what it was. <laughs> I think that's, that's exactly 100% what it was. What it was. Okay, okay, he, okay. he couldn't have her, so he wanted to f- fuck her ex girlfriend. That yes. was the whole thing. Okay, great. That was 100% was going on for him. And like, and was like, very clear. I, yes, I love that. And, and I, then he regretted. And I, yeah, no, I think he was just like, wait, like he hadn't asked. He hadn't I asked. I wonder how if, many students he had hooked up with that were like underage and that right. you were, yeah. But I was yeah. like, don't care. I didn't care. Like I got home. I like went home and woke up my roommate and was like, I fucked, said the professor's yes. name. <laughs> See, she was like, that- What? And I was like, oh, yeah. And she was like, oh, yeah. wait, me, baby. what? But like I now looking back, I'm like that. There's so many layers. And there's like a lot. I love. Listen, that. yeah, I've been roped into so many people's sexual mishandling and traps in their minds. Yeah. It's Meepaw not for gets me. The traps. I, was not always get I don't I I was like, do you oh, want to yeah. leave? You I was like, 
I don't know what's going on here for you psychosexually, but do you want to get out of here? It's, a, it's <laughs> appealing to me for some yes. reason. Sometimes that's like the hottest thing. If you see someone has some like damaged thing and you're like, yeah. oh, I'm ready that. to be their trigger and I can pull them into this thing. And if they want to agree to do it and it's a fucked up reason why, but I feel great about it. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, whatever. Like I, and I also knew, I knew of him and I like from right. rumors and stuff. And I had, and I was like, what am I going to leave school and not have sex with this dude? Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But also I was like, I just remember the darkness of being like, I know that you're freaking out and I know why you're freaking out. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm 18 and I'm also not going to blow up your life. So good day, sir. Let's never talk again. It's fine. You're sweating, but goodness. Yeah. You took a gamble and I'm the right one. See you later. (laughs) Well, you know, as Susie Orman would say, listen, Gabby, thank you, Gabby, for being with us today. Gabby. Gabby. God. (laughs) <laughs> no, thank um, you for having me. I love you. I'm I'm such a fan. I love you guys so much. Well, oh, likewise, you. we appreciate it. Um, people can follow you at Gabby Road on Instagram. Yeah, on Instagram. It's a Beatles pun. That's one B. G a b y r o a d. Yeah, That's and then it. on Twitter, G a b y d u n n. And then I have and a it- a podcast that just came out, Audible original called Apocalypse Untreated. But I also have a bunch of books. Get the Bad with Money book and the Bad with Money podcast, since we talked about that so much, and and uh, hopefully it's helpful to you in some way. You are such a busy person with I a very can- impressive amount of products in the world. I'm I'm, it's really I'm fantastic. scared of death, and I'm running really hard away from it well i think that's what we're gonna call the show scared of death scared and of running death. Uh, right. which will be fantastic so uh thanks so much for listening to sloppy seconds uh you can follow us on instagram at sloppy pod send us an email at sloppy seconds pod at gmail.com or call in with your fuck talk story and we will play your voicemail on tuesday that phone number is two one three five three six Nine one eight zero. zero. That was in sync for me. You can follow Big Dipper at Big Dipper Jelly on Instagram and me at Spicy's Meatball on Instagram or Fat Drag Meatball on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't ever miss an episode, which now come out every Tuesday and Friday. Friday. Okay, that's it. We Goodbye. did it. Bye. Doodle doo doo. Forever dog. Oh. To listen to Sloppy Seconds ad free, sign up for Forever Dog Plus at Forever Dog slash. Plus, Sloppy Seconds is produced by Forever Dog and Moguls of Media. Mom! Hosted by Big Dipper and Meatball. Mixed and mastered by William Pitt. Executive produced by Willem Belli, Alaska Thunderfuck, Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. Our artwork is drawn by Christian Cimarroni. And our theme song was written by Mike Malarkey.